ערב טוב לכולם. Good evening everyone. I'm delighted that you're here. And I think it's going to be fascinating. And we have the privilege here to host Ms. Lisa Miara, who has come from Iraq, the only Israeli woman who lives in Iraq, to talk about her activities there. I visited her there a number of times. I was there, in fact, three times. And we're going to start with a kind of introduction about what we saw and what we heard just in the last few days. There is a battle going on in Mosul. And while we are talking, Lisa received a report that a young girl of 13 years old who was in the hands of, of ISIS for three years, she was a sex slave, a sex uh, slave, and sold in the markets. She was actually extricated. She was rescued from them by an entire network of people who rescue such children that Lisa is working with. And now she, for the first time ever, returned to her family. It's 140 kilometers from Raqqa. They succeeded in getting there and releasing her. The last time, I think it was just before Passover, I went to Lisa and I was in Mosul in the north of Iraq and we all managed to reach all the way through to Mosul with a Bashmerga the Kurdi army, and we saw how they were advancing. And I am in touch with the Pope, the Holy See, Franciscus, and he knows exactly what's going on there. And he asked me to come to Rome after my visit in order to personally directly report to him about that great battle against ISIS that could become the last battle against them in Iraq. So when I came and I spoke to him and reported about Lisa's activities, I said, this is not only a really, a precept, a good deed, but this is a third world war. It's a war of the third world, in fact. Because in this area, there is an international coalition unprecedented in humankind. We're talking about NATO having joined all this coalition, even Interpol is within it because this struggle against ISIS has become established on policing and fighting terror. And the feeling is when you get to Mosul, this big town in Iraq, the feeling is that you have reached the apocalypse. Dozens of kilometers of buildings that are totally just relics of buildings. We're talking about stones this size, not only because of the bombardment of uh, the, the superpowers that have been going on night and day, but also as a result of the ISIS activities. But before that, they mined everything. They entrapped everything to such a way because they wanted that damage to be ongoing. So I interviewed people there. And suddenly you hear these explosions around you, and that is because someone walked on a mine that ISIS had left. And for us, we, near, we actually saw that on one of those, it was completely entrapped with explosives and everything. We couldn't even go in there. The refugees were trying to run away and escape Mosul. There are about 100,000 residents in Mosul who are still hostages of about 1,000 combatants in Mosul. And yes, that battle is about to end in the next few weeks, at least certainly within the summer, this summer months. You can see refugees who have succeeded in escaping ISIS before they were shot. There are those who were caught by ISIS and shot at immediately and killed. But the Kurdistan army is stopping them at junctions, at the crossroads, and trying to guess who is an ISIS man who's trying to camouflage himself as someone else, shaving off their beards and trying to sort of quickly stealthily get in. And are the other people's faces of refugees who've managed to get out of a camp where Lisa lives in, which is only 30 kilometers from Mosul, the Shalia camp and other ones. There are about 20 five camps like that, people trying to reach Mosul to those liberated areas to find something, a remnant of their home, a remnant of all their lives and their little object, a little girl looking for a doll amongst the remains and the, 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 de the destruction there. 
but they take them and they take them into the refugee camps. But in the headquarters of ISIS, you can understand what that organization is. They're using the 21st century technology in order to return the actual, the whole Middle East back to the days of the seventh century. You're talking about rifles and modern technology and data about sex slaves who are being sold in the markets at least once a week. It's the Sabaya market in Mosul and in Raqqa and in, in Syria. You're talking about fines, protectionism, and that people that didn't succeed in taking things, they've boycotted their certificates. People who, mercenaries who've arrived from different countries and their papers, we're talking about, about a, 100,000 who arrived from Europe, and you can see the Shaheed's photographs. And under that kind of town, there is underground, an entire tunnel town, underground tunnels, where there, there are caches of weapons and artistic works of art that they s pillaged and looted and stole in Syria and Iraq and hid there in the tunnels. And these tunnels reach the, in the actual houses themselves all the way through this, this network of tunnels through the, to the headquarters. And they said that the policy against ISIS is based on three factors, drones, loans, and phones. Drones is that unending bombarding. 50,000 people were killed a monk from the ISIS people. Ca yes, fatalities. It looks like slightly a larger number, but that is what was actually what the bombardment of the Americans caused of the ISIS soldiers. But these drones that are actually operated by people who are actually in the United States from Nevada, Texas, they actually operate their joysticks and with their cameras they can assault the ISIS camps. And alongside that, you have the loans. In other words, an attempt to try and stop that flow of money at the moment. That shrinking of ISIS in the area and all the G world jihad organizations they're coming across, dire straits from an economic point of view because uh, the Americans are actually prohibiting the sale of their oil that they used to so happily sell to Bashar Assad and to Turkey. Um, and they were trying to sell even the the Syrian oil at a lower price. And when I say phones, I'm talking about what looks to me like a pretty close to mo mission impossible in the war against ISIS. And that is the, the one for public opinion. ISIS managed to produce 1,300 films that are now being disseminated on the internet. It's a kind of digital caliphate. In, with all their digital possibilities, films, um, clips, Facebook, Twitter, anything possible that they uploaded, the level is cutting edge in an unprecedented way. So even the Pope said, and the Americans, and the coalition forces said, we have to learn how to develop ploys and tactics that are counter that. In other words, somehow can you prevent the ongoing mobilizing of youngsters from around the world and Europe joining their ranks, harnessing and really curbing this energy? So in Morocco and in the Gulf areas, you're talking about hundreds of thousand fatalities. You're talking about half a million, and in Syria, if not more, and also in Libya, in Yemen, and Iraq. After all, there is unemployment there. There are over 100 million unemployed out of 380 million uh, Arabs in this area. Most of them are young people, people who have never worked in the past, the majority of them, and they reach the age of 50 without even having worked one day in their life, and that is a ticking bomb. We're talking about the slavery that we're going to talk in a few moments with Lisa. So we're going to talk about a conversation I had with ISIS prisoners through the Kashmirga and we saw a number of prisoners, and I spoke with them for two and a half hours to try and fathom who they are, why are they there, how did they reach ISIS. I'm going to tell you about one concrete conversation with Ziad from Raqqa. That's basically the Islamic State's um, capital in Syria, and that's where the, the last battle took place, or 
after Mosul. And he spoke a fluent, wonderful English, actually sounded with a British accent. And he said that he wanted to study literature at university. And I actually found him after a battle against the Kurds that had gone on for a number of hours. And he has got his... Um, handcuffs on and I managed to talk to him and ask him why did you join ISIS and I, he said honestly and sincerely to me I had no other alternative they came to Raqqa they told us to go to the mosques each man who was over 16 all the way through to the age of 16 my father my cousins my my brothers my uncles all of them, by the way, were completely sort of gagged and their, only their eyes could see where they were going. They said, either you join ISIS and you give, get $100 a month and then we'll protect you, or you do not join our ranks and neither you nor your families will survive, just like in the mafia. And so, of course, all of us joined their ranks. And I asked him, and what do you think today? And he said, today, I understand, after I studied <laughs> this whole issue of, of these years, that ISIS is right. We ought to create a caliphate. And if I said, but what if this caliphate doesn't work? I mean, after all, you're going to lose in Iraq and Syria. And he said, correct, but we will continue. We will continue all the way to Al-Quds, Jerusalem, until we kill the greatest infidel of all, the Pope, until we reconquer Al-Andalus, Spain, and Portugal, which should be under the auspices of the Waqf, the Islam. And then we will continue because when they spoke about the 1,000 cuts, we will use those knives and cars and we will hurt any infidel wherever he or she may be in any and every country. That is the heritage of ISIS that we will continue to perpetuate. So ultimately, that Marazani, the general, who is a kind of chief of general staff of the Kurdi army, said that they're like Genghis Khan. After all, through their psychological warfare, warfare and the social network brainwashing and that digital caliphate, they succeeded in conquer an enormous territory. Now they're shrinking, but the idea is that we need to fight against not only the military arena, but that of the psychology and ideology because weapons of mass seduction. That is what they called it. In other words, mass seduction operated by ISIS mainly for the young people in the Muslim world, those 50 million Muslims that are in Europe, perhaps even more than that. And amongst them, inter alia, there were youngsters through the Sheikh Google. They, through the internet, they mobilized. There's a Jerusalemite woman called Lisa Miara from Machne Yuda in Jerusalem, who used to go from time to time, and ultimately she decided to settle in northern Iraq in order to perhaps do a tikkun olam, perhaps somehow rectify the atrocities that were carried out against the Zaidis and those people who suffered their atrocities in Iraq. <laughs> What happened to you? ساعات السيده طالقه مع بنيان امنا نفسنا هذا ساعات شاشي يسبه ديما مدرو نشتيبون وطالقه ديم تاعنا ما مشش بالبوكر يو يريوت اني منسى لترجم تاع الدريم هم هاغو هرب انشيم اخر كخ هم كتبوا اتشمام شل 10 بنات אנחנו קיבלנו מתנות, ואחר כך קיבלו גם כן סיגריות כאן, העבדות והברוטליות של ימי הביניים שחשבנו שהלכה מהעולם וחלפה ממנו. רבים מהם יזידים ונוצרים שנרצחו על ידי דאעש, הפעילים של המדינה האסלאמית. רק לעיתים רחוקות יש אפשרות להתאסלם. רוב הזמן אין ברירה. בשבועות האחרונים יש נשים צעירות שחזרו למשפחותיהם והם רוצים לספר מה הם סבלו. 
בתנאי ששמם לא יתגלה כי יש להם גם אחים, גם אבים, גם אבות וגם ילדים בידי המדינה האסלאמית, ג'מילה, בת חמש עשרה, נחטפה למשך חמישה חודשים בידי הרדיקלים, היא מאוד יפה, היא נמכרה כשפחה לראש העיר שנשלטת על ידי דאעש. כל דמעותיי יבשו, ראיתי ילדות בנות שבע שנאנסו אני הייתי קפואה, לא היו לי מילים. דאעש הם כלבים, הם חוטאים, אידיוטים שמפחדים, הם כופרים. סבעיה. זה השם שהופך את הנשים האלה לנשים שרוענות מפחד. זהו השוק, שוק השפחות. וזה שבראקה, שהיא הבירה האסלאמית, הנשים היזידיות הן הקורבנות. ברוכות הבאות לסבעיה, אנחנו מוכרים היום את הנשים, כל אחת לגורלה. איפה האישה היזידית שלי? היום ישנם כאלה אשר מוכרים ואלה שקונים. היזידים מונים כאחד מיליון. הם מפוזרים בכל מיני מדינות במזרח התיכון ובאירופה, מחציתם בעיראק. הם שייכים לדת רודפת שלום שהגיעה מהרם נהריים עם אלפי שנות היסטוריה הם, הם חוו רצח עם בכמויות והדת שלהם מאמינה בטבע והם תמיד מתפללים בכיוון השמש על פי לוח הזמנים שלהם בשנת ששת אלפים שש לפי אמונתם הם קורבנות לרצח עם שהעולם מתעלם ממנו. בחמשת הימים שהיינו שם לא ראינו ולו עיתונאי אחד באזור ואפילו לא ארגון עזרה אחד. היה זה מדבר של אדישות. תודה found just right expected word. Lisa Miara, Lisa Miara, the floor is yours. Please join us here on the podium. Hello. Hello, and thank you, Enrique. Welcome. I must begin with a question everyone has on their minds right now. You immigrated here from London in the 1970s. You raised a family, three children, six grandchildren, Jerusalemite, beautiful, in Machna Yehuda. Why Iraq? What are you doing there? Don't give me psychologists. I am sane. It is a way that life has led me to because it uh, began in 1998 when uh, my, my son was in the IDF and was involved in the Tselim operation and throughout the Intifada and to the year 2000 and the cafe moment, terrorist attack, and life changed. 
and for some reason I could not bury our children in Jerusalem and go home as if nothing happened. And therefore, I opened up the Springs of Hope Foundation in 2002 in response, minimal response, to what I have uh, experienced, what we have all experienced. And two and a half years ago, I was invited to Al-Habja, which is about 10 kilometers away from the border with Iran in Kurdistan a place where Saddam Hussein carried out a genocide of his own people in 1988. And from there, I insisted on going to Dukhuk. I entered the Camp Sharia, which is 35 kilometers away from Mosul. Yes, 35 kilometers away from Mosul. And I couldn't not raise a voice. I could not but try to bring to people's awareness, to the world's awareness, what is happening to the Yazidis, the women and children. I could not, but I couldn't visit the place and then go home and say, okay, I've done it. I was a tourist. I watched it. I saw it. Done, finished. It only just began. When your foundation was established following the terrible um, tragedy, actually two terror attacks that your family was involved in, and I saw you seeing your shock with what happened there at the junction in Judea and Samaria, and you were filmed. I could see the shock on your face, and I understand that it really hurt you terribly, and I understand that there were children there that you knew, you, you knew at Cafe Moment who were killed in that terror attack in 2002, if I'm not mistaken. But how did you get to there from Iraq, to Iraq from there? Okay, so you were invited to Khalabja. How did it happen? I'd like to just make note of one thing. I don't accept anyone f to volunteer if they were traumatized. You have to take care of it at home and then go be heroes somewhere else. Because everything we have acquired and everything that we have accumulated, it's always looking for a way out. Following studies, following research and colleagues and scholars that have filed international lawsuits against the pipes of the, of the money, the money that was transferred through banks to terrorists, terror organizations, and the embargo over Saddam Hussein. And I was invited to Halabcha to, to meet those who were victims of the gas attack. And we went there to Halabcha. It was a small place in the middle of nowhere. And it was the eve of the Holocaust Memorial Day. And as a Jewish woman, my world just stopped. To see all these Kurds who had been um, killed using sarin gas and, and, and mustard gas, and I didn't think I would live in Iraq. I didn't think I would come back there. I didn't think I would come there and I would research the Yazidis genocide. But it was a way that under very organized processes, very calculated processes, with the right people alongside me, Step by step, it led to the path and life that I live today. And these days you live where? I live 60% of the time there. And yes, I have set up a Kurdish foundation with a Kurdish residency. Yes. And what are you doing there, in fact? Nowadays we are very active in all the strategic operations to uh, rescue the women and children from the hands of ISIS. And after they are rescued, it is, the focus is on, re on normalizing and educating the children, the children like Akram, who you've met, who's a 10-year-old, who was taken into the ISIS army at the age of seven. Yes, he was enlisted into the ISIS army at the age of seven. Okay, so clearly that's your activity. But how do you do it? I mean, I saw in your kitchen, in the refugee camp, a group of men that you are managing, and they have their hands and their, uh, their phones in their hands, and they are on the phone with ISIS, and they get notifications and messages as we're sitting there. And suddenly, there's a picture of a girl with a detonation, belt. detonation belt. And, he's, uh, and they say, if, he sh if she's not released, you don't pay $12,000 by tomorrow morning, this girl will detonate herself, will be a suicide bomber. And you started working, and the next morning you called me, and we went to see how the little girl comes back. 
poor little girl after three years of having been in the slave market and had been sold to eight different men. And this little girl, who was 11 years old, she was eight when she was first abducted. We didn't see the look in her eyes during those days we were there. How do you organize these rescuers? Explain how that works. First of all, I always know things post facto, not in advance. I know who's on the list of being rescued or of being bought. I know about the big picture. I can tell you that Khalil is sitting for several months already and working on rescues from the heart of Mosul, even though Mosul is nearly at the end. There are still Yazidi women who are being held at the very heart of Mosul. We're now talking about Abdallah right now for two days is trying to rescue a 16-year-old boy who has been enlisted and recruited to ISIS. And if the, la if the two years out of the last three, he was in Raqqa because uh, for about a month he, was he went to Tel Azur, about 40 kilometers away from Raqqa. And now there is a process. I know who is going out there. I don't exactly always know what the entire process involves until afterwards. I can tell you that there are huge changes on the ground the whole time. Once Abdallah and his friends bought a um, bakery at the very heart of Raqqa, and for an entire year we managed to operate it with SIM cards going in and out in breads in bread loaves, loaves of bread, and that's how people were identified, that's how information was passed on to people, and that cannot be repeated. There are safe houses. Every rescuer has at least three, four, or five safe houses in various areas, Talafar, Raqqa, Mosul, they get placed there. When we talk about an operation or a rescue operation, it doesn't end in two hours. You don't just grab the child and abduct her and, or buy her and that's it, go home. It can take 12 days to bring them and pass three, four days and then lose the place, get rid of it, buy, buy a car, ditch the car. About 100 people work for Abdallah Baraka. They all wear hijab and niqab because it is easier for them as Muslim women to get to those places without attracting any attention. So there are acquisitions, there are purchases. Like when you saw, when you were sitting at our house, where WhatsApp, every Monday night, we get all these images of the girls that were going to the slave market the next day with the prices tagged. And it's a terrible way of exerting pressure on the families to come up with huge sums of money or else watch their child get a sold to Kuwait, Afghanistan, Libya, Morocco, and then never see them again. You knew this, this com community. It is very closed off. It is very traditional, very modest, and very humble. And we get pictures on the WhatsApp that is porn. You see men sitting there, Abdallah, and we taught them how to blur pictures even before we go to the family, the extended family. The story of the Yazidis is a minority that throughout history has undergone many jihadist and extreme Muslims attempts to get, make them convert to Islam, and they have refused. They are very peaceful. They don't believe in, um, in going against people. And, and we were, saw Baba Shawish, and he told you in a conversation you had, if you can't rescue them now, after two or three years in the hands of ISIS, when three-year-old children become soldiers, it'll be too late. What did he mean? He meant that it would be best for them to live among Muslims, among that world, because they're already lost. After three years, they are weak, their souls are weak, they're mentally weak, they are physically weak. And it's not just teaching them how to fight. It's torture. Most of our women, and these are things that the Western world has stopped for two or three minutes if they were just to look and say, how many times can that woman be raped? But what about the torture? What about women who refused? I don't want to say to surrender to this rape because that's not the right word, but to accept this rape, to be raped, and was hung 
feet up on fans in the ceiling and they went round and round for three or four days about being beaten and they're still being thrown out of the window breaking their legs and arms what about all the torture they've all undergone all experienced it gets to a stage where you saw that child after two and a half years she is out Her, after six seven eight weeks it's been there she is still out and I saw how you got the refugee camp with a bag with rescue, the rescue drops to give that little girl. At least psychologically it does something. Yes, but this image of her sitting down, having returned to the refugee camp, and there's no one left, no one left of her family. It's unbelievable. It was like sitting shiver. It was like a mourning. Yes, because there's a moment of relief, I would say that it's been two and a half years, almost three years, and this child, this girl or boy or woman are home, but it's not really home. Where's Sinja? Where's life? Where's her family? Where's home? Where's the business? Where's, uh, how can you provide for yourself? It comes to the refugee camp, to a tent that was already completely disintegrating after three years, and with an extended family. It's finding out that your mother is gone, your father is gone, your husband is gone, and mass graves in Mosul. No one knows. It's another shock, and yet another shock. Just over a year ago, when we traveled and we came to visit you for the first time, it was my second visit, actually. We saw you for the first time, and it was amazing to me that you had managed to organize a fashion show with all the girls who had come back from ISIS and they threw off the clothes that they had worn while being at I with ISIS and a very well-known designer came from the US and you held a fashion show and I understand that you tried to attract the world's attention but you in fact stood there and you started to speak in Hebrew and to quote verses from the Bible and you said that you came from Jerusalem and that you're a Jew and an Israeli and the Iraqi TV was there a TV crew and I have to ask this banal question how did you say that? Didn't you, weren't you afraid? Well, first of all, I have two things to say. Yes, it is in order to attract the world's attention, but also within the traditional community where it's very similar in some ways to the Arab culture of respect, of honor, of reinstating the women's st status in the eyes of men. The, fact, the matter of the Iraqi media, that was one big mess, and it cost me, I had to pay with threats. And if I had known that the Iraqi media from Baghdad was there, I would never have said I was Jewish and Israeli. It wasn't planned, it just happened. But I've always said that if I cannot live my identity, then I shouldn't be there. So it just so happened to happen unplanned, but it, I did pay a price for it. I was threatened. What happened? Well, soon afterwards, I got a phone call from a parliament member who asked me to come to a certain place. He came there with another person, with a guard, and he gave me very clear instructions and told me to cancel meetings, to do things here and there, and I was given a guard a uh, security guard for three days. On the fourth day, I woke up in the morning and he said, goodbye. And I was trying to be very careful. I don't go to places. I don't look for adventures. And I'm connected and linked and I listen to the right people. I'm attentive to the right people when people tell me not to do something or not to travel somewhere. Here, I would argue, there I don't. I talk to your neighbors at the refugee camp who live in tents, and they slaughter goats first thing in the morning or something. And they told me, we are taking care of Lisa. That's what they told me. But I assume that the authorities also saw in you a type of spy, a Mossad uh, spy who came to see what's happening. Well, that was the headline in one of the newspapers, one of the leading newspapers in Iran the next day after the fashion show. It was Zionist spy Mossad agent living in Sharia. 
and I was invited, I was asked to come to the authorities and I was interrogated. It took me a few months, several months, to get out of it and to clear my name. And these days I am in good touch uh, with uh, the systems. I report to them. I keep telling them. They come to my house. They drink tea with me. We take care of everything that needs to be done and uh, I'm protected. I don't think I will reveal any secrets if I were to say that the ties between us and the Kurds that in September will hold a referendum about their independence are ties that have gone back to being very tight and close. And yet I do want to go back to the activity. You talked about the girls. And I understand that every Tuesday they publish pictures of girls who will be sold on Wednesday on the market. And we saw pictures of the sabaya of the market and what, it, and what happens there. And then you send the rescuers who come disguised as Arab men who buy these girls. How does that work? Explain that to me. We get the photos on WhatsApp and then we go to the families to see what can be done. In Dukhuk, there is a fam there is an office of the abdu of those abducted, and you can get loans from them if there's enough warning, enough time. And there are people like Abdallah, who do send their team simply to buy this woman and to rescue her. And there's also Abdallah Adris, Bazad, um, who have many many aliases many, many bank accounts and all sorts of, ch excuse me, accounts in all sorts of chat rooms where they pretend and try to abduct, to steal women right from under their noses moments before she has gone to the market. And the children, Lisa, what does one do with the children? Is that a warning that we have to conclude? Yes. Okay, so we will in a few moments. Let's just talk about the children and then a last question. The children, I understand, from the age of three onwards were given real basic ammunition training. And from the age of eight, they know how to drive so that they can blow themselves up if necessary with explosives. And they even teach them how to cut off people's heads and behead them. Akram, tell me a little bit about me. Yes, one day I was in uh, his extensive fam extended family in the tent, and I was, uh, they were cuddling him, and they were drawing pictures. And suddenly he got up, and his entire body language changed, and he looked at me in my eyes, and he said to me, if you continue talking in English, I'll have to behead you. And so I looked at him, and I didn't for one moment lower my eyes, and I said, I know you're capable of doing that, and you can do it, but if you do it, you're going to lose all the love there is, and I am one who is giving you. And then he sort of folds himself up within and becomes a little child again. And he says, yes, but that is how I was taught at ISIS. And I said, I know, my darling, my little life, but that is how I was taught. And we continued to play together. Lisa, when you came back the first time and we got a phone from Shimon Peres of blessed memory, and he'd seen the, the, the report about these little girls, and we sat down with him for a long time, and he wanted to know every single detail, as you always did. And he said to us, we need to create a world campaign, literally launch it, and I'm willing to be part of it. But we didn't have sufficient time. We didn't have a chance. He passed away before we succeeded in doing that. So what are you asking from the world? What needs to be done? Because very few too few talk about it. I no longer have expectations from the world, but as an Israeli and a Jew, I have an expectation from us that we will get up and launch some kind of initiative that we will unify, that the voice and deeds will start from here for the sake of the Yazidi people and others and similar, and for those who are going to be next in line. Because as I, as a Jew, believe in tikkun olam, and I believe that from here, a tremendous power and a tremendous voice can be heard. 
on Wednesday you're going back. What are the sentiments? I'm dying to be there. Oh, I miss them so much. Why? What is wrong here? No, no, on the contrary, I love it here. I'm, I'm, I feel good here. But this is my vocation. I'm just supposed to be there and I will be there. Well, the best of luck and look after yourself. Thank you very much.